Suppose you know you want to produce 10 bushels of corn. You could ask, well, how do I know that? We're going to cover that in the next chapter. And actually, this chapter is really long. It's going to take a long, long time before we get to the next chapter in which we can ask things like, how do you decide how much corn you want to produce? So right now, we're going to take Q here, 10 bushels, as given. In other words, we're just going to suppose that you have figured out that you want to produce 10 bushels. Again, the way to figure that out, the way to choose the optimal Q, needs to be postponed for quite a while until we get to the next chapter. For this chapter, we are going to assume that Q is already known. Or rather, we're going to work things out assuming that Q is an arbitrary number. So 10 bushels is an example. On the lower left, I graphed the 10 bushel isoquant. In the previous chapter, we learned there were lots of different W and F combinations that could get you 10 bushels of corn. In this chapter, we have to answer the question, if you know you want to produce 10 bushels of corn, which one of these points on the isoquant should you pick? And the we get the answer by using the graphs that we drew in the previous lesson. Remember in the previous lesson what we did is we had this family of total cost lines. The axes were W and F, and each line represented a different amount of total cost. Total cost 1, total cost 2, total cost 3. Given Q equals 10 bushels, what the firm wants to do is minimize cost. In other words, the firm's problem is to minimize the total cost subject to Q being 10 bushels. Uh, on the lower left, I've already drawn the subject to Q equals 10 bushels part. In other words, I know I need to be on that curve. Now let me do the minimize TC part. So I need to bring TC information into the bottom graph. And the TC information is obtained in that kind of way from that graph, from the graph we did last time. So what I'm going to do is superimpose the total cost lines onto the graph on the left. So that's what I've done. In the lower left, I've, I've superimposed a family of total cost curves onto the graph. Now there are an infinite number of these total cost curves because as I explained before, the firm isn't limited to a certain budget. The firm has complete freedom over how much money to spend on inputs. So I can't draw all of them. I, I drew six of them here. The question that the firm faces is how to minimize total cost subject to being on the Q equals 10 bushel curve. Now there are lots of different ways of producing 10 bushels. You can produce 10 bushels here, for example. That's a possibility. That puts you on TC5. You could also produce 10 bushels here. That's also on the curve, and that puts you on TC4. TC4 is closer to the origin, the 0, 0 point. TC4 represents a smaller total cost outlay than TC5 does. You've got a choice of these two, you start, the firm is not going to want to go to TC5. The firm is going to want to go, if, if it has a choice between these two points, the firm is going to want to go to to this second point, the TC4 point, because it represents smaller costs. But the firm doesn't, doesn't stop there. Actually, this firm can do better. Now, it turns out this firm can't get to TC2. TC2 would be really nice, or TC1 would be even the, the nicest total cost uh, line that I drew here. Uh, TC1 is closest to the origin, but but if you look at TC1, it doesn't reach the 10 bushel isoquant. And so you can't get by with spending that little money on inputs and still produce 10 bushels, because it's too little money. You can't buy enough water and fertilizer to produce 10 bushels. Let's look at this point. I claim that that point that I marked with the rectangle is the point where the firm is going to want to go. The firm there uh, 
can produce 10 bushels like you wanted to because that point is on the 10 bushel isoquant. In terms of total costs, that firm is experiencing a total cost of TC3. And I claim that that's the smallest amount of total costs that it can get away with spending while still being on the 10 bushel isoquant. I can extend the isoquant a little bit more up here. And you and there you could see there'd be another way of producing 10 bushels over here, but that wouldn't be good. That would just that wouldn't be any better than the than this point here. Uh, it's just getting you TC4. So definitely the best place for the firm to go is is the the place that I marked with a rectangle. That's the that's the optimal point. There's one thing to notice about this optimal point. At this optimal point, there is a tangency between the total cost line, which is here, and the isoquant, which is here. And you know that tangencies mean that you have uh, equal slopes. In other words, at the optimal point, which is the cost minimizing point, we have the slope of the total cost curve equal to the slope of the isoquant. Now, we figured out the slope of the total cost curve in the last lesson, but let's quickly remember what that was. The cost equation is total cost equals the price of water times water plus the price of fertilizer times fertilizer. I've got F on the vertical axis of the graph, so let me solve the equation for F. It gets minus PW times W plus TC equals PF times F and divide by PF minus PW over PF times W plus TC over PF equals F. So that's the uh, equ equation in straight line form. So this is the, s is the slope. So the slope of the total cost curve is minus PW over PF. Now, in the previous chapter, we talked about the slope of isoquants, and we defined minus the rate of technical substitution of W for F as the slope of the isoquant. Now, we actually find the rate of technical substitution as minus the slope of the isoquant. So you multiply both sides of that equation by minus 1, you get that the r minus the rate of technical substitution equals the slope of the isoquant. So if you multiply both sides of this, this equation by minus 1, you get PW over PF equals the rate of technical substitution of W for F at the... Let me, let me uh, give this a... Uh, name. Let me call this point A. At the optimal point A. So that's a characteri characterization of the optimal point when you have this tangency. In most examples that we work, you are going to have this tangency. You can have situations where the optimal point isn't characterized by a tangency. We studied some of those in consumer theory. It usually happens when the isoquant has a kind of odd shape if it's not uh, curved in exactly the same way that I've got it drawn here. The basic principle is always going to be the same, namely that you... Let me draw a weirder isoquant. Maybe it looks like that. 
you decide on what Q level you want. Okay, then that's fixed. And then you draw in the total cost curves, and you find which total cost curve can uh, still touch the isoquant but generate the least amount of cost. That is, which one of the family of total cost curves is closest to the origin but still touches the isoquant. And that will be the cost minimizing point. The problem we've just been solving we call the problem of cost minimization. So that's the topic we've been discussing. Now, this phrase might seem weird because if you just think of cost minimization as what's the lowest total cost that the firm can get away with, in other words, what's the smallest amount of money that the firm can spend on inputs, the answer is, at least in what we might call the long run, we'll talk about long run and short run later, the answer is zero. The firm, if it really, if all it wanted to do was simply minimize cost, it would just not produce, not, not buy anything, not buy any inputs. And then it'd have a cost of zero. So that's not an interesting question. It's not an interesting question how should the firm go about minimizing costs, because the answer is the firm can go about minimizing costs by buying nothing. Instead, the interesting question is how can the firm minimizing co minimize costs given a certain amount of production, which is, uh, which, which is what, what we, uh, what we posed over here. How can the firm minimize costs given a certain amount of production? So that's the that's the essence of, of what we of the interesting problem that we call the cost minimization problem and this is the way to solve it. Now in the rest of this chapter we're going to we're going to do something that's actually quite a bit more difficult. We're going to try to figure out how to graph the relationship between Q and cost. And you'll notice that Q isn't on any of the axes in the graphs I've drawn so far. The axes have just been W and F. And cost hasn't been on any of the axes either. The costs have been represented by the, the value of the total cost lines that were drawn. So at this point, we've got no idea at all, actually, how to draw a graph with Q on one axis and total cost on another axis. This is going to be a very difficult problem to solve. So that's where we he that's where we headed, but the we have accomplished quite a bit uh, when the firm has complete freedom of which W and F to choose. In other words, where to be in the WF graph, then we figured out, given Q, how the firm is going to choose the cost minimizing point. And we will agree to postpone the decision of which Q to pick until next time.